In lecture 11, we introduced determinants and cofactors. We saw how determinants tell us whether a square matrix has an inverse. In this lecture, we'll see how determinants and cofactors can be used to solve systems of equations. The first method we'll consider is Kramer's rule. In module 2, we'll develop a method of finding an inverse and thus solving a system of equations. This is the adjoint method. We'll also see that an inverse provides some useful information. Module 3 provides an overview of how matrix algebra can be used in economics. We'll look first at the Leontief input-output model, and then an example from econometrics. Gabriel Kramer was a Swiss mathematician who published what is now known as Kramer's Rule in 1750. This method is useful if you want to solve for just one variable in a system of equations. It's computationally inefficient for solving for all variables in systems of more than three equations. Kramer's rule is quite simple. The solution for a particular variable is just the ratio of two determinants. The denominator is the determinant of the matrix of coefficients. The numerator is the determinant based on the matrix of coefficients, but we replace one column with the column vector of constants, the right-hand side values. Which column we replace depends on the variable that we want to solve for. If it's the first variable in the argument of the function, we replace the first column, and so on. We actually came across this in lecture 11 when we looked at the solution of a two equation system. We had our two equations in matrix form and then the solutions. We saw how the denominator for the solution of each variable is the determinant of the matrix of coefficients. Now let's look at the numerator for these solutions for x and y dp minus bq can also be expressed as the determinant of a matrix. In this case it would be pqbd. The numerator is d times p minus b times q. We could call that the determinant of a subscript x because this is the matrix of coefficients with the first column replaced by the right-hand side constants. Similarly for y, aq minus cp can be expressed again as a determinant. That would be ac in the first column and then pq in the second column. So once more, a times q minus c times p. In this case, we have the second column replaced by the vector of constants. We can do the same thing for a system of three equations. To solve for x1, the first variable in the argument, we replace the first column in the matrix of coefficients by the vector of constants. So we have the ratio, the determinant of a1, over the determinant of a. Similarly for x2, we replace the second column with the vector of constants and for x3, the third column. As I mentioned earlier, we usually use Kramer's rule when we want to solve for just one of the variables. Now we'll apply Kramer's rule to a couple of examples. First, we have a simple macroeconomic model. So this is two equations, two unknowns. And then we'll look at a system of three equations. In this example, we have a very simple macroeconomic model. Why is national income? usually measured as GDP. It's a function of consumption by households plus investment by business plus government expenditure. Consumption is a function of income. A is an intercept term and B is the proportion of income spent on consumption. So B is equal to the marginal propensity to consume. As I said, this is a very simple model. In the tutorial, we extend the model by including taxation, so we have consumption as a function of disposable income. We could make investment a function of interest rates, and so interest rates become an exogenous variable. That includes monetary policy. This is a closed economy. We could add exports, imports, and exchange rates. In any case, this is the type of model that we might use Kramer's rule for. Say the government sets a new level for government expenditure and they want to determine the change in consumption. Then we'd solve for C. 
These are our original equations. We want to get them into a form where we have the variables on the left and the constants on the right. Equation 1 becomes y minus c is equal to i plus g. Remember i and g are exogenous variables. We treat them as constants. Equation 2 We'll have y first, so we'll have minus by plus c is equal to a. Now we get the equations into matrix form. The coefficients for the first equation are 1 and minus 1, and for the second equation, minus b and plus 1. A matrix of coefficients have y and c as our variables, and on the right hand side, the constants i plus g and a. Now we have our equations of the right form. We solve for c using Cramer's rule. Where c is equal to the determinant of the a matrix with the second column replaced, divided by the determinant of a. Let's work out those determinants. The numerator is the determinant of a with column 2 replaced. Column 1 is the same, 1 minus b. And then in the second column, i plus g and a. Then take the determinant. That's equal to 1 times a minus, minus b times i plus g. That's a minus minus, so plus b times i plus g. Determinant of A is equal to well, 1 minus B. The second column is minus 1 and 1. Take the determinant. And that's equal to 1 by 1 minus minus B minus 1. Simply 1 minus B. C is equal to determinant of A2 on the determinant of A. And that's equal to a times b times i plus g over 1 minus b. For this very simple model, the answer is straightforward. But imagine you're an economist who wanted to determine the consumption in a model with 10 equations and 10 unknowns. In example 2, we solve for x in this system of equations. This should be very familiar from lecture 11. First we get our equations into matrix form. Now we'll solve for x. This is our formula. It's the ratio of the determinant of a with the first row replaced by the vector of constants divided by the determinant of a. We'll find the determinant of a first. There's a zero in the first row, so we'll expand along that row. Our first term will be well, plus zero. We have a plus sign there. Our second term will have a minus sign, and then the element 2 times the determinant of the submatrix. So it'll be 1, 3, minus 3, 2. Our third term has the plus sign. The element is minus 1 times the determinant of the submatrix. 1, 1, minus 3, 2. It's equal to minus 2 times 2, 1 times 2, minus minus 3 times 3, so that will be plus 9, minus 1 times 1 times 2, 2, minus minus 3 times 1, so it'll be plus 3, and that's equal to minus 27. We find the determinant of the matrix AX, where we replace the first column with a vector of constants. There's minus 7, 2, minus 10. The remaining two columns are the original ones. So 2, 1, 2, minus 1, 3, 2. Once again, we'll expand along the first row. We'll have plus minus 7, the minor, 1, 3, 2, 2, minus, 
2, the minor, 2, 3, minus 10, 2. And the third term will be plus, minus 1, and again, the third minor, 2, 1, minus 10, 2. It's equal to minus 7 times 1 times 2, 2 minus 6, minus 2 times 2 times 2, 4, minus 3 by minus 10, plus 30, minus 1 times 2 times 2, 4, minus 1 times minus 10, plus 10. It's equal to 28 minus 68 minus 14 and that's equal to minus 54. Now we can solve for x. x is equal to the determinant of ax on the determinant of a. Well that was equal to minus 54 on minus 27. So x is equal to 2. That was so much fun. Let's solve for y as well. y is equal to the determinant of a y, substituting the second column with the vector of constants over the term of a. Determinant of a y is equal to the first column's the same, a 0, 1, minus 3. The third column's the same, minus 1, 3, 2. The second column is the vector of constants, minus 7, 2, minus 10. Take the determinant. That's equal to 0. Our second term is minus, and we, our element is minus 7. Times the minor, that'll be a 1, 3, minus 3, 2, plus minus 1 times the 1, 3 minor, 1, 2, minus 3, minus 10. Expanding that out, we'll have plus 7 times 2 plus 9 minus minus 10 minus minus 6, that'll be plus 6. And that's equal to 81. Y, again, is equal to the determinant of AY over the determinant of A. This is 81 divided by minus 27. And so Y is equal to minus 3. I'll leave you to show that Z is equal to 1.